In this video, we'll be discussing the Domain Name System, or DNS, the protocol that translates domain names into IP addresses. Let's get started. The Domain Name System, commonly referred to as DNS, occupies an interesting position in the internet ecosystem. This is because it is very much a part of the internet infrastructure relied on by other services and a basic part of the internet functionality. However, programmatically, it operates at the application layer, meaning it relies on service from the internet to function itself. The basic idea is that it's difficult for humans to remember IP addresses. This is especially true today with IPv6 addresses being 128 bits long. So the DNS provides a distributed database to map between human usable names and IP addresses. In order to make this system scalable, it includes a hierarchy of DNS servers. Clients, which are part of end-user hosts, communicate with this hierarchy in order to resolve names to IP addresses. There are several more fine-grained functions included in this database. Beyond the basic behavior of translating host names to IP addresses, DNS includes aliases, where one host name is mapped to another host name. It includes records specific to email servers, allowing an email server to find out the fully qualified name of an email server for another domain and it can provide a one-to-many mapping, returning multiple IP addresses for a single domain name. This is commonly used for load distribution and is an important part of the behavior of content distribution networks, which we'll look at in a later video. Database systems are almost always simpler to manage if they are centralized on a single machine. However, with something as critical as the DNS, we would not want to centralize it because that would make it a central point of failure. The DNS also has to handle a massive amount of volume, which we would not want to transport to a single location due to congestion issues. Thirdly, centralizing the database would inherently mean it was distant from some users, increasing the delay that they would incur in resolving domain names. To put the scale of the system in context, a single residential ISP resolves over 600 billion DNS queries per day. Let's look at the design of the hierarchy. There are a set of root DNS servers, and in their records, they contain the mapping for the TLD servers and their IP addresses. TLD stands for top-level domain. The TLD servers are things you recognize like .com and .org and .edu. These TLD servers contain the mappings for the authoritative domain servers, and the authoritative DNS servers in turn contain the mappings for individual servers that provide different services, such as email servers or web servers, or in some cases, mappings for end user machines. As a basic approximation, a client will need to perform three queries to determine the IP address of the machine they want to reach. In this example, the client wants to find www.amazon.com. First, they query the root DNS server to find out the IP address of the .com TLD server. They then query the .com TLD server at the IP address they now know to find out the IP address of the authoritative domain server for amazon.com. Lastly, they query that authoritative domain server at its IP address to find out the IP address of the www. server within amazon.com. In practice, there are a number of mechanisms in place that make it so clients often don't have to perform all three of these queries. And we'll talk about that more in a few slides. Root name servers are a critical part of the internet infrastructure. There were originally 13 of these in order to provide redundancy around the internet. Since then, this number has grown to several hundred, with over 200 in the US alone. However, there are only 13 names and IP addresses for these root name servers, and traffic is routed using the Anycast method, which will be discussed later on in the course. One of the primary services provided by ICANN is managing the root DNS domain. There are many different top-level domains, and the servers for these domains are registered with the root servers. Some of these are divided by categories, such as .com or .org or .edu, and others are divided regionally, for example, by the top-level country domains. For an organization to manage its own domain name, it needs to designate an authoritative server and register that server with the TLD servers. This is the function that a domain registrar provides for you when you purchase a domain name and submit the relevant information. There's another type of DNS server, which we haven't mentioned yet. This is the local DNS server, also commonly called a recursive resolver. If you've ever configured a host with IP addresses for DNS servers, this is the type of server that you're communicating with. End clients do not traverse the DNS hierarchy directly. Instead, they submit their query to their configured local resolver, and the local resolver in turn queries the DNS hierarchy. The benefit to this is that it will have cached recent queries from your own host and others that are part of the local network. This means it may already have the answer to your query in place and be able to return it immediately without having to traverse the hierarchy. This both gets you the result faster and reduces load on the DNS hierarchy. Let's follow an example query through the DNS system. So first, the DNS client contacts its local DNS server. 
and at each point it is requesting the IP address for gaia.cs.umass.edu. The NYU local DNS server does not currently know this mapping. So first it needs to find out the IP address of the .edu TLD server. It issues this request to the root server. The root server responds back with the IP address for the TLD server, and then the local resolver queries that server. The TLD server then responds back with the IP address of the authoritative server for umass.edu, and the local DNS server can query the authoritative server for the fully qualified domain name. When the response to this comes back, the local DNS resolver will then have the answer that the client was looking for and can forward that answer to the client. This is what we call an iterated query. The local resolver iterated through the entire hierarchy to find the answer. Note that the client did not iterate itself, it is the local resolver that performed the iterated query. An alternate DNS behavior is called recursive queries. This is what the client issues to the local DNS resolver, and hence the reason that they are commonly called recursive resolvers. Let's look at how a recursive request differs from an iterated one. The client issues the request to the local resolver, the same as before, and the local resolver forwards that query on to the root DNS server, again, the same as the first time. Now the difference is that the root DNS server takes it upon itself to forward that query to the TLD server. The TLD server forwards it on to the authoritative server, and the authoritative server responds back with a fully qualified domain name to the TLD DNS server, which sends it back to the root server, which sends it back to the local resolver, which sends it back to the client. Now the local resolver can still cache the results of this query, and so subsequent requests won't go to the root server. But for any request that the local resolver doesn't know, this now increases load on the top levels of the hierarchy, meaning the servers that are the most critical, and requires them to both forward the requests and maintain open state while they wait for the responses to come back. Because it is undesirable to concentrate load at the root of the DNS hierarchy, in practice, the root DNS servers do not support recursive queries today. I've mentioned caching a couple times. Let's look at that in a little more detail. Once a name server learns a mapping, and typically we're talking about the local resolvers, it will save that mapping in addition to returning it to the client that requested it. For example, since most queries refer to one of a few number of TLD domains, the information for the TLD servers is almost always cached, and it is rarely necessary for a local resolver to query the root. Also, common authoritative servers will be cached in the same way. For example, Amazon, CNN, etc. This means that the client's query can often be forwarded directly to the authoritative name server without querying the root or the TLD levels of the hierarchy. For common DNS addresses, the local resolver may already know the exact IP address for the query the client is making and be able to respond with that immediately without contacting any level of the DNS hierarchy. When hostname mappings are returned from a DNS server, they include a TTL or an expiry time. This forces the local resolver to renew its cache after some interval and not store this mapping forever. This is important because some mappings, particularly those used by CDNs, may change on a frequent basis. There are many types of DNS records, but here are some of the most common. The records stored in DNS are called resource records. And the primary type that we usually think of is type A. This maps a hostname to one or more IP addresses. Also very common are CNames, which map one hostname to another hostname. NS records designate the name server for a domain, specifically the authoritative name server for a specific domain. And MX records designate mail servers for the domain. The DNS protocol consists of queries and replies. The format is the same for both, but there is a flag set which indicates whether a particular message is a query or a reply message. As we mentioned, clients make recursive requests asking the local resolver to perform the rest of the query for them, while local resolvers must perform iterative requests because the root servers do not support recursion. Note that one message can include multiple queries or responses. The answers include the relevant resource records, and there may be multiple resource records that come back in response to a single query. For example, if the query is for a host name that turns out to be a C name, the server may helpfully supply both the C name record and the A record corresponding to the object of the C name. Otherwise, the client would have to perform a second query to get the A record. Now let's look at the process of getting those records into DNS. So a new entity would first need to register a domain name with one of the DNS registrars. DNS registrars are companies that are trusted by the organizations that operate the TLD servers to enter information about new authoritative domain name servers. 
So the registrar inserts the NS records specifying what name servers are authoritative for the newly registered domain name. Most registrars also offer a service of operating an authoritative name server for their customers. However, this is not required. The NS records could point to a customer controlled authoritative name server. Note that the NS records installed at the TLD server map a domain to a host name. An additional A record is required to supply the IP address for that host name. Both of these records will be maintained in the TLD server. Aside from the authoritative name server, any A records desired by Network Utopia must be configured in the authoritative name server. In addition, we see that they're supplying an MX record to designate their email server within their authoritative name server. Like other protocols we've looked at, Security was not a primary concern when DNS was designed. The DNS hierarchy is constantly under attack, with the root servers being bombarded by requests in order to cause them to do unnecessary work and reduce their availability for legitimate requests. So far, caching and filtering has been largely successful in preventing the denial of service of the DNS root. Likewise, TLD servers are susceptible to the same sorts of attacks. Aside from attacking the DNS directly, there are also attacks that leverage the DNS in some way. These can include intercepting DNS responses and changing the content, poisoning DNS caches, and using DNS servers to send unsolicited responses to victims by spoofing the victim's IP address in the original query. There is an RFC known as DNSSEC that explicitly attempts to address many of these issues. However, it has been very slow to be adopted. This completes our overview of DNS. In the next video, we will look at peer-to-peer -peer applications. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.